Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello and welcome. My name is Jacob Steele, the events manager for Banyan Books. Today, we are delighted to be hosting Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler to speak on his new book, In Search of a Prophet, A Spiritual Journey with Khalil Gibran. This book and event celebrate the 100th anniversary of the publication of Khalil Gibran's beloved classic, The Prophet. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that although uh, we have guests that join from around the world, the physical location of Banyan Books is on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, a little note that Paul Gordon welcomes your questions, so please feel free to type them into the chat box at any point during the event. And if you have any technical related questions, uh, you can just email them during the event to events at banyan.com. And now for introductions. Paul Gordon Chandler is the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Wyoming. He grew up in Senegal, West Africa, and has lived and worked extensively around the world. An author, art curator, social entrepreneur, and an authority on the Middle East and Africa, he is passionate about using the arts to further our global quest for a more harmonious future, both with each other and with the earth. He's the author of several books, including the acclaimed book on Muslim-Christian relations, Pilgrims of Christ on the Muslim Road. His new book, in Search of the Prophet is a compelling spiritual journey through Gibran's writings, art, and the places he lived. In Search of a Prophet breathes life into the captivating poet artist who moved beyond religion to the core of universal spirituality and was a unique blend of East and West. We are so delighted to present Paul Gordon Chandler. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Jacob. It's a real privilege to be here uh, this evening. And of course, I wish I, we were all together in person. But I really want to thank everybody that has signed on to uh, really attend to hear a little bit about someone who I think is not only one of the most profound figures to have lived in the last century, but who I think is increasingly, exceedingly relevant for our times. Someone who was a migrant, and ended up very much a prophetic voice during his own lifetime, and whose words are really even more timely today. Khalil Gibran, the early 20th century Lebanese-American, poet, artist, and mystic, usually best known in the West as the author of The Prophet. And often, if I'm speaking to people in person, I would hold up The Prophet, and this is what it looked like, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but, and ask how many have in their own lives, one way or another, come into contact with that book, whether it be in person or through their parents or their grandparents, et cetera. And it is truly remarkable. Often it's 90% of the audience raising their hand and saying they have. Sometimes something written long ago becomes even seemingly more relevant than during its own day. It's kind of what happened, of course, to George Orwell's book, 1984, here in the West, not so long ago. But more than ever, I think there's a need to hear voices that call us to unity and to respect and to be inspired to live deeply and generously in our thinking and actions toward the other, whomever the other is. 
And I believe Khalil Gibran is just that voice and his profound insights offer our day much needed wisdom and guidance. It all started for me uh, when I was living and working in the Middle East, uh, which I have spent most of my life in the Middle East. And I was struck by how enthusiastically Khalil Gibran is loved both throughout the Middle East and of course in much of the West. The East was proud of him and the West admired him. And he, be, he was in many ways this uniting figure. And I came to discover that Halil is really that's a supreme East-West figure and as a result can be an unparalleled spiritual guide for our times related to peace and harmony and certainly be, the building of bridges between those of different backgrounds. And his life approach and work touches on so many of the critical issues of today. A bridge between creeds and cultures, yes, but care for the environment, equality for women, interest in spirituality as opposed to religion, immigration, the status of refugees, conflict in the Middle East, the inclusive embrace of those of different faiths and learning from the best in each tradition. And the list goes on and on. And of course, in another way, he touches on a spiritual depth that so many hunger for as well. As it was said about Ibn al-Arabi, the 13th century Arab Sufi mystic and poet and scholar, he is a man for this time because he has his foot in every camp. And for me, I wanted to delve more deeply into his own kind of inner spiritual formation and immerse myself in his writings and the environments that shaped him. And more specifically, I sought to understand what led him from being someone born into what was then an exclusive, sectarian, and intolerant historic Christian community in Lebanon to becoming someone who embraced all in our world and as a result became one embraced by all. And writing this book took me all over the world to museums, to art galleries, to churches, to synagogues, to mosques, through revolutions and through counter revolutions, literally. It first involved over the course of several years, visiting all of the places that he lived and taking Khalil with me, so to speak, through his writings and reading everything he wrote in the order he wrote them in the place that he wrote them during each respective phase of his life. And it also led me to the far reaching places of influence. His writings and art have traveled. I began in the birthplace, uh, his village, uh, named it's, it's uh, known as Bishari, high up in the snowy mountains of Lebanon, and then on to Boston, where he and his family emigrated, to Paris, where he did his art training, to New York, where he spent most of his career, ending up of all places in Mexico City at that spectacular Museo Sumaya, where the largest collection of Khalil's art and writings in the Western Hemisphere is held and so many places in between where monuments and streets and schools and parks, uh, et cetera, are named after him. And it didn't take me long to realize that I knew a lot less about Khalil than I had imagined. I knew he was Lebanese. I knew, I knew he was of Christian background, though I, when, he, when I was younger, I must admit, I thought he was from a Muslim background. I knew that he had lived in the early 1900s, and I knew that he had written, of course, the best-selling book of spiritual pose, prose poetry, The Prophet. However, what I didn't know was far greater. I didn't know that Khalil was one of the most widely read poets in history, behind only Shakespeare and Lao Tzu. I didn't know that Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash were among his greatest fans, and each of them gave away thousands of copies of The Prophet. Elvis had actually completely memorized the book and was able to recite it at a moment's notice. He even had an ambitious plan to make a film of the prophet, which he didn't get to because of his early death. I didn't know that Khalil was a friend of the Teddy Roosevelt family. I didn't know that he was sought out by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats to have his portrait drawn by him. I didn't know that he knew and drew the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung and the Indian Nobel Prize laureate Rabindranath Tagore. I didn't know that he met Auguste Rodin, the great French sculptor, when Khalil was actually studying there in France. 
And while he was there in France, some of the great Impressionist artists were still around, Monet, Renoir, Degas, Marie Cassatt, and even Picasso was around then. And while he was there, that's when Marc Chagall actually moved to Paris. I didn't know that the morning after the Titanic sank, when he had obviously was, had been troubled and unable to sleep, that he struggled to know if he should cancel an appointment to draw the portrait of the leader of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha, and he decided to go ahead with the sitting and was profoundly moved by Abdul Baha's calming presence. I didn't know that during the height of the American prohibition on alcohol, Khalil, with his proclivity to Iraq, that strong Levantine anise flavored alcoholic drink, was amazingly able to secure this kind of continuing flowing stash of the contraband. I didn't know that Queen Noor of Jordan had uh, was really influenced by Khalil's work at a young age and is an avid promoter of his writings, as are the actors Salma Hayek and Liam Neeson. I didn't know that Khalil was almost excommunicated by his own Maronite Catholic Church as a heretic for his early attacks on the religious hypocrisy that he saw in it. And yet paradoxically, at the end, during his funeral at the cathedral in Beirut, he was honored by the Maronite patriarch and other church authorities in Lebanon, as well as leaders from other faiths from all over the world. I didn't know that Khalil's writings were instrumental in starting or sparking really a revolution and renaissance of Arabic literature as he broke with those rigid Arabic literary canons of his day and that through his prose poetry really developed a whole new genre of Arabic literature. And I didn't realize that he was in, at an early age a political revolutionary and speaking out through his writings against the injustices of the Ottoman Empire and its occupation in Lebanon, which was termed Syria then, and calling on his fellow countrymen to rise up and free themselves from that oppressive yoke I didn't know that one of the wealthiest men in the world, Carlos Slim, a Mexican of Lebanese heritage, has one of the largest collections of Khalil's art and writings down in Mexico City. I didn't know that one of the US President John F. Kennedy's most famous quotes was taken from an article Khalil wrote in Arabic to his countrymen, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I had no idea of the scope of his influence worldwide, both in terms of his reach geographically and as to the diversity and the breadth of groups that identify with him. I remember being in Timbuktu, Mali, in the Sahara Desert and being at the home of a friend of mine who's a Tuareg, the blue men of the desert. And in this mud brick home, there is a copy right there on the floor of Gibran's The Prophet in French. And he seems in many ways to be claimed, if you will, by every group and circle imaginable. Khalil the poet, Khalil the novelist, Khalil the essayist, Khalil the activist, Khalil the revolutionary, Khalil the painter, Khalil the counterculturalist, Khalil the philosopher, Khalil the artist, Khalil the modernizer of Arab literature, Khalil the prophet, Khalil the new age guru, Khalil the visionary, Khalil the humanitarian, Khalil the Sufi, Khalil the Christian, Khalil the Universalist, Khalil the Interfaith Mentor, and the list goes on and on. He's an enigma begging the question, will the real Khalil Gibran please stand up? The renowned contemporary Syrian poet Adonis sums, summed it up perfectly, I think, when writing about and speaking about Khalil. He said he's a star spinning outside the orbit of that other sun in his universal acceptance. Khalil's older friend, a fellow writer, Amin Rahani, said of him, through Arabic, he conquered our minds, and through English, he conquered our hearts. Gibran, Khalil Gibran, was born in 1883 into a Maronite Christian family high up in the mountains of Lebanon, a region known as the Kadisha Valley, meaning the Sacred Valley. It was a place that had sheltered his people during various invasions and resounds with majestic natural beauty, which had an important and a lasting influence on him. And in contrast though, to those gorgeous peaceful surroundings, um, he was born into a period of political and interreligious strife 
as well as one full of corruption by religious authorities during the latter part of a 400 year long Ottoman occupation. All circumstances that would influence his life and work for years to come. His grandfather had been a Maronite priest and thanks to his mother, he was taught some of the great epic biblical stories which captured his imagination at a young age and showed up again as imagery that echoed throughout his future writing. Khalil's father, however, was not very reliable, prone to drink with gambling debts, and he was accused of embezzlement while working for a local Ottoman administrator and was sent to prison and all the family's property was lost. And so his mother eventually decided with other relatives uh, to immigrate to America and he did so with, she did so with Khalil and his older half brother and his two younger sisters just before he entered his teenage years, the age of 12. And although Khalil spent only 12 short years in that magical mountainous setting, it was to serve as the foundation of his spirituality and worldview for the rest of his life. Once here in America or in North America, he, they settled into Boston South End and Khalil began to learn English. And a whole new world of artistic and literary influences began to inspire him. And concerned, though, that Halil was losing his Arab culture, and especially those marvelous values that come with the Middle East, his mother decided to send him back to Lebanon and to complete his high school education under the watchful care of a Maronite Catholic school in Beirut. And then his story unfolds from there. Upon his return to Boston, and within an 18-month period, he lost one of his sisters and his half-brother to tuberculosis, and then his mother to cancer. And then a devastating fire destroyed pretty much all of his artwork to date. And as a result, he began to write more intensely and became very involved with the world of Arab immigrant writers in Boston at that time began to express his writings through outspoken, and some might even say at that time, scorching articles in Arabic newspapers in the US and books and magazines. And as an immigrant, he discovered that he had the liberty to write in a way that he would not have been able to do if he had actually been living in the Arab world at that time. And he began to call on his Lebanese people to question ideologies as he himself began to grapple with religion and spirituality. He spoke out in his articles against the oppression by the Ottomans and was concerned by sectarian strife that was more often than not fueled by the religious authorities and their hypocrisy. And then, he, of course, he spoke out for women's rights at that time. And for the next 10 years, from 1903 to 1913, from the age of 20 to 30, Khalil would seek to balance that push and pull of those two linguistic and artistic worlds. And he found himself actually poised at a confluence of cross currents between the East and the West. And he determined to tear down walls of injustice, being, and he eventually found himself as a result threatened and excommunicated uh, from authorities, or threatened with excommunication from the Maronite Catholic authorities of his upbringing. He had just completed a brilliant work at that time titled Spirits Rebellious, in which one of his short stories is titled Khalil the Heretic. And in it, he blasts the hypocrisy of religious corruption and oppression of the weak and the vulnerable. And not surprising, not too long after this, while in Paris, representatives from the Patriarch in Lebanon, who were actually visiting Paris, asked to see him. And he tried, and they really tried to put him back in line. And he recounts the encounter uh, much, somewhat uh, much later quite lightheartedly this way. One, Muslim, uh, one bishop had a sense of humor and the other none. Non-humorous took him aside. You have made a grave mistake and are making a grave mistake. Your gifts you are using against your people, against your country, against your church. And the patriarch realizes this. And now seek out every copy of the book. This is that book, Spirits Rebellious. Destroy them all and let me take word back from you to Syria and the church and the Holy Patriarch. Well, uh, as you can imagine, that uh, exchange only spurred Khalil on further. And he actually early on saw himself somewhat as a revolutionary and a rebel, writing that life without rebellion 
is like the seasons without spring. And he was an advocate for freedom within and without. And uh, he wrote to a cousin in Brazil these words, which I thought were quite profound. He said, the people in Syria, meaning Lebanon, are calling me a heretic, and the intelligentsia in Egypt vilifies me, saying, he is the enemy of just laws, of family ties, and of old traditions. These writers are telling the truth because I do not love man-made laws, and I abhor the tradition that our ancestors left us. This hatred is the fruit of my love for the sacred and spiritual kindness, which should be the source of every law upon the earth, for kindness is the shadow of God in humanity. And through his Arabic novella titled Broken Wings, he began to be an advocate for women well ahead of his time. Khalil held an incredibly high view of women, whether friend or stranger or lover or sister or mother, and he consistently fused his admiration for them into the essence of his painting and writing. This is especially noteworthy considering, of course, the patriarchal society of his childhood and also the time period in America in which he was immersed as women were in the thick of the fight for the right to vote. And even his view of God echoed these convictions of gender equality, and it pushed the boundaries of the accepted norm at that time. He wrote, most religions speak of God in the masculine gender. To me, God is as much mother as God is father. God is both father and mother in one. However, interestingly, albeit an activist early on, as he often wrote of growing into our greater selves. It was a phrase he loved very much. He actually himself matured into someone with a graciousness towards all and an all embracing spirituality that reached across the divides of humanity, building bridges of peace, as well as becoming more of an artistic contemplative, using his many creative gifts to communicate his spiritual insights. At a very crucial time in his own development, his lifelong friend and patron, Mary Haskell, appeared in a supportive role to him, and she helped set him on a course, actually, that would allow him to pursue and cultivate his many gifts. She eventually funded two years of art education in Paris to allow him to master the fundamentals, and from that experience, he was able to discover and cultivate his own unique style that the world now knows him for. And after his time in Paris, he moved to New York City, and he continued to publish works in Arabic and exhibited his artwork in a few very significant galleries there. And then in 1918, his first book written in English, not translated from Arabic, written in English, was published. It's titled The Madman, which was quickly followed by a second book in English titled The Forerunner. And then in 1923, his third book in English, The Prophet, quickly gained worldwide acclaim as Khalil's message of universality and respect was reaching far wider audiences. And this is actually the 100th anniversary, of, therefore, of the publishing of The Prophet, which is why this book has just come out. Khalil was also, at that time, working already on his longest English book titled Jesus, the Son of Man. So, and he worked on it most of his adult life, seeking to return the Jesus that he felt that had been disfigured by the West back to his Middle Eastern origins. And he published that creative masterpiece just three years before he died at the age of 48. And the more I studied of Khalil's fascinating journey, the more intrigued I actually became of his inward journey. And more than anything else, it was evident that he, his life was lived toward what you might call a deeper dimension. And he wove this passionate intent into the core of his writings and his art. He was a natural mystic who quite simply sought to build bridges and tear down walls. And his voice is timeless, appealing to heart and mind and faith and reason, a guiding spirit in a time where stereotypes and misunderstandings are increasing ever widening divides. As he so powerfully wrote, I believe in the book that makes us all brothers and sisters equal before the sun. 
I believe in the teachings that set you and me free from bondage and place us unfettered upon the earth, the stepping place of the feet of God. And certainly I think heeding his wisdom would go a long way today toward healing our world. And in this regard, I, there seems to me to be two overarching themes to Halil's life and his work. And the best analogy I can think of is that of a river, which was an analogy he used a lot, but of a river flowing deep and wide. Deep. The, uh, as he plumbed the depths of the inner life, he actually goes, in, goes to the core of human existence. Khalil was forever exploring the deepest of life's questions on the purpose of being, he writes. Spiritual awakening is the most essential thing in life, and it's the sole purpose of being. He who does not befriend his soul is an enemy of humanity, for life emerges from within. He described himself as going into the silence, intentionally so. He wrote, only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. He even named his new New York studio the Hermitage, and he decorated it sparsely in a manner that created really a contemplative atmosphere for him. He had a simple wooden bed, several crucifixes made of wood and metal, a small brass chalice, an easel, and then this large tapestry of the Middle Eastern Jesus hung on the wall above an altar-like table with brass candlesticks. I love Khalil's uh, short story uh, called The Tempest, and it's infused with the imagery of the hermitage of his own childhood village in Lebanon, and it's actually the hermitage where he is now buried there in the mountains near uh, his village of Bishari. But that short story tells the story of a young man who is roaming through the beautiful cedar forest in the mountains in one autumn afternoon and gets caught in this terrible rainstorm. And so he seeks cover in an isolated shelter that's inhabited by a hermit named Yusuf. And he'd heard of Yusuf uh, from the local villagers and he'd always longed to meet him to kind of hope to learn his spiritual secrets. And so this storm provides him the perfect opportunity. And when the young man's welcomed into Yusuf's shelter, he notices that the old man is tending to a bird with broken wings. So symbolism abounds here. And the old hermit, Yusuf, engages in conversation and slowly imparts his wisdom through all this beautiful imagery. And he shares that he left the world to live in the awakeness of life and to think upon the compelling and beautiful mystery of existence. I came to this far corner of God's domain for I hungered to learn the secrets of the universe and approach, the clo the, approach close to the throne of God, he says. And then the climax of the story is reached. The hermit leaves the young man sheltered in his hermitage and walks out in the height of the storm as just pounding down, saying, I'm going now to walk through the night with the tempest. It's a practice that I enjoy greatly. I hope you will teach yourself to love the tempest. Khalil consistently succeeded at crafting these poetic invitations to journey toward the depths of one's life, exploring that in a rich reservoir within. In another reflection, he notes, God has placed in each soul an apostle to lead us on an illumined path. And yet many seek life from without unaware that it is within them. When someone asked him once, what's a mystic? Khalil is said to have smiled and replied, nothing very secret nor formidable, just someone who has drawn aside one more veil. Khalil was constantly listening, paying attention to life and in search of greater interior depth. The soul is mightier than space, he said, stronger than time, deeper than the sea and higher than than the stars. And he was preoccupied during his entire life with the depths that he knew the spirit of humanity was able to plumb and the heights that he was convinced humanity was destined to scale, always striving towards that deeper dimension. Khalil spoke of his painting process in similar terms to his friend and patron, Mary Haskell. He said, when I paint a picture, I try to give the picture a presence 
It's the coming together of certain elements in certain ways as if they made a sort of path along which God can come through to our consciousness. And the collection of imagery and created synonyms Khalil used for God are many, the infinite, the almighty, creator, nature, love, eternal wisdom, the unseen, the eternal altar, all powerful, supreme infinite, Lord of life, of love and of death, great spirit, great intelligent being, great power, the unknown, the great sea, the absolute, the great river, the list goes on. Of Khalil's belief in God, one of his contemporary Lebanese uh, biographers, Alexander Najjar, writes, what kind of God did Gibran believe in? His view of God was not mainstream. Gibran's mysticism is a convergence of several different influences. Christianity, Islam, Sufism, Theosophy, and Jungian psychology. He rejected fanaticism and religious segregation of any kind and called his own convictions from a synthesis of different religious messages without their dogmatism. He could not reasonably confine himself to any one of the great monotheistic religions. And over and over again, Khalil focused in his work on love for God rather than religion. And during a time of deep despair and questioning, he wrote, but somehow when I feel like a little helpless fish in a muddy lake, I cannot help but say to myself, the air which is above the water is not muddy. I cannot lose my faith in the God element. And it's in a time, I think, when it becomes harder and harder to listen to our own inner selves, our souls, or even what we may need spiritually, Khalil exemplifies someone who journeyed intentionally inward, creating room for silence to listen to the quiet nudgings of his soul and intent on allowing both the high really and low moments of life to weave together into one voice. And it's that voice within a voice that Khalil wanted his readers to hear when reading his writings. As his good friend, the eminent uh, American architect and writer Claude Bragdon wrote, his power came from some great reservoir of spiritual life, else it could not have been so universal and so potent. But the majesty and the beauty of the language with which he clothed it were all his own. And it's this depth which led, I think, the actor Salma Hayek to produce a really a, a marvelous animated film on Khalil's book, The Prophet. And one of the most enjoyable trips I took actually working on this book was to attend the Toronto International Film Festival for the premiere of that animated adaptation of The Prophet, uh, which is this marvelous feature film inspired and produced by Salma Hayek and written and directed by Roger Ehlers, best known, of course, for The Lion King. And I've got to tell you, with the exception of the film Gandhi, which I saw, you know, many years ago, when the film was over in the, the, uh, the cinema or in the theater, no one moved. It was such reverent silence. Uh, and people were there from all over the world. And it was profound to see that kind of natural silence that settled into place. At the after party, I had the opportunity of speaking with Salma about her inspiration in producing the film. And with her uh, cont contagious uh, exuberance, she shared her own conviction uh, to the prophet uh, and her own really connection to it through her Lebanese grandfather, whom she adored. And as a child, she remembered seeing a copy of the prophet always on his bedside table. And as a young adult, adult, she read the prophet herself and was very, very moved. She said this, she said, I found out that there are millions of people around the world who have shared the same kind of connection to this book in which the words of Khalil have so strongly impacted them positively and spiritually. And when you read this book, something really strange happens inside of you. Your soul recognizes it as truth. She went on to tell us that that's why she made the film. She said, I thought it was crucial that we pay further tribute to this man who was an Arab who wrote a book of spiritual philosophy that unites all religions and all countries and all creeds and from many different generations. 
And I think in those comments, I believe Salma really captured the essence of Khalil's inner journey because the deeper he went, the wider his embrace became. And the depth of Khalil's spiritual journey led to this extraordinary breath of spirit in which he experienced the oneness, really, of humanity. The reservoirs that he cultivated in the deep gave him the capacity to go wide. And arising from his internalized bridging of the Eastern and Western influences in his life, this faith emerged over time that transcended all cultures and religions. Addressing his fellow Arabs in the Middle East, Khalil wrote, and this was a very tribal world at that time. Humans are divided into different clans and tribes, but and belong to countries and towns. But I find myself a stranger to all communities and belong to no settlement. The universe is my country and the human family is my tribe. And thou art my brother and sister because you are human. We are both children of one Holy Spirit. We are equal and made of the same earth. Khalil went beyond, went beyond religion to really the core of a universal spirituality. And Khalil's beliefs cut through all those divides, reaching across to the other. And as he said so powerfully, your neighbor is your other self dwelling behind a wall and understanding all walls fall down. He recognized, of course, the necessity of boundaries and nations, and yet he strove really toward a, a borderless citizenship that transcended geography. And I love the way he uh, expressed his collective embrace of humanity with this poetic visual imagery of a cloud. He wrote, aphorisms in English titled Sand and Foam. And in it, he wrote, should you really open your eyes and see, you would see your image in all images. And should you open your ears and listen, you would hear your own voice in all voices. And touching actually on the most sensitive topic of all, still is in many ways in the Middle East, religion, Khalil does so by looking, interestingly, to the nature of God. And he writes, you are my brother and sister, and I love you. I love you worshiping in your church, kneeling in your temple, and praying in your mosque. You and I are all children of one religion, for the varied paths of religion are but the fingers of the loving hand of the supreme being, extended to all, offering completeness of spirit to all, and anxious to receive all. Finding a way to powerfully communicate really a non-sectarian version of spirituality was something that weighed heavily on Khalil. And consequently, he felt that all the events of his life seemed to lead him toward the creation of his most well-known book, The Prophet. This is what it looked like when it first came down out. It was known as The Little Black Book. And it was immediately, almost immediately sold out. He wrote about the prophet, he wrote, it's the biggest challenge of my life. My entire being is in the prophet. Everything I've ever done before was only a prelude to this. And he felt a sense really of sacred responsibility in writing it, almost as if it was to be a holy book. Even the process of writing it was a type of kind of spiritual rebirth for him. And embodying East and West, it speaks to people from all religions, it prompted his friend and patron and sometimes editor, Mary Haskell, to remark upon first receiving a copy of it uh, just after it was released. She said, oh, Khalil, it's the most loving book ever written. It actually had its, its uh, literary debut at St. Mark's in the Bowery in New York City. Khalil knew the rector or the priest there in that church at that time. And it was a, there was a well-known actor that actually read the entire book through and Khalil was there in the audience and he commented afterward, I wanted it first read in a church. Interestingly, as Khalil continued to journey spiritually, 
he actually sought to sift through all of his own religious upbringing, through all the baggage and trappings and traditions that have accumulated around it over the millennia. And just as the Dalai Lama is said to have encouraged the Trappist monk and writer Thomas Merton to not convert to Buddhism, but rather to go deeply into his own tradition to find its core essence, Khalil finds himself doing the same and discovers the figure of Jesus in a new way. And he came to see the person of Jesus as far beyond Christianity and instead as really a universal sage for all of humanity. And in Jesus, he saw this kind of all-embracing figure, and he was enraptured by his character. He wrote, his life is the symbol of humanity. He shall always be the supreme figure of all ages. And one of my favorite little vignettes of Khalil's is about separating the Jesus of history from the Jesus of a religion, Christianity, that grew up around him after his life. And Khalil writes, once every hundred years, Jesus of Nazareth meets Jesus of, of the Christian in a garden among the hills of Lebanon, and they talk long. And each time Jesus of Nazareth goes away saying to Jesus of the Christian, my friend, I fear we shall never, never agree. And observing the corruption and inequalities and sectarian power plays of the church in Lebanon as a young man, he was naturally drawn to this radical aspect of Jesus' all-embracing, inclusive love and the strength of his humility, the antithesis of the church at that time in his country as he had experienced it. As in Halil considered Jesus, interestingly, the greatest of all artists and, artists and poets, he called him the master poet who makes poets of us all. He also pictured Jesus as a fellow Middle Easterner and felt a deep personal cultural connection to him. And hence the opportunity to write about Jesus's life became this ever increasing aspiration. And his book, Jesus, the Son of Man, was the longest and last book Khalil wrote before his death. And some in many ways see it almost like a fifth gospel. And in it, he del delivers this mesmerizing picture of the essence of Jesus. And I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of what he means by that. In the book, he actually portrays the life of Jesus through the eyes and voices of 77 different individuals, some historic, some other purely fictional. And the often controversial figure of Mary Magdalene makes more than one appearance in the book. And interestingly, many of the characters in the book are women. But his portrayal of Jesus through the eyes of Mary Magdalene, I think, profoundly illustrates how he had come to see Jesus. So Halil gives voice to Mary Magdalene in these words. It was in the month of June when I saw him for the first time. He was walking in the wheat field. The rhythm of his step was different from other men's and the movement of his body was like not I had seen before. Men do not pace the earth in that manner. And even now, I do not know whether he walked fast or slow. And I gazed at him and my soul quivered within me for he was beautiful. And I felt my ha left my house and walked towards him. Was it my aloneness or was it his fragrance that drew me to him? Even now, I do not know. But when his dawn eyes looked into my eyes, all the stars of my night faded away. And later she says, and then he stood and looked at me, even as the seasons might look down upon a field. And he smiled. And he said again, all men love you for themselves, but I love you for yourself. And then he walked away. But no other man ever walked the way he walked. Was it a breath born in my garden that moved to the east? Or was it a storm that would shake all things to their foundations? I knew not. But on that day, the sunset of his eyes slew the dragon in me. Although Khalil often spoke directly of God, his writings and art were infused really with a much deeper concern, and that of living in harmony with one another and all of creation. He wrote, I bid you to speak not so freely of God, who may be your all, but speak rather to and understand one another, neighbor to neighbor. And he realized, of course, that uh, while his spirituality served as an attempt to connect with the transcendent, 
that it could not be confined to creeds or dogma. And so to search for God solely in a mosque or a synagogue or a church or temple was to really limit one's search for wholeness. And so he actually began to look really much broader, more broadly, and into the very fabric of creation. In other words, the environment. And certainly at, at an age when issues in our environment are at the forefront with deep respect for the earth, his holistic worldview rings forth because he did not separate the spiritual dimension of life from the natural world, but he rather saw them very much in harmony. Just after Easter in 1931, after a battle with ill health, Khalil lay dying. He was taken to St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, the same hospital that had received survivors from the Titanic disaster for treatment, and then was used again to treat victims after the September 11 attack. At the age of 48, with cirrhosis of the liver and tuberculosis in one lung, Khalil slipped from this world into the realm he believed would be an endless dawn forever the first day. The breadth of diversity and the outpouring of appreciation for his life says it all, reaching across all the religious and cultural divides. As requested in his will, Halil's body made his pilgrimage back to Lebanon. And upon receipt, arriving in, uh, by ship in Beirut, the coffin was opened and he was posthumously awarded the Declaration of Fine Arts Medallion by the Ministry of Education for his life's work. And then led by dignitaries, uh, French military officers, diplomats from all over the world, and leaders from Christian, Muslim, Druze, and Jewish communities, along with crowds of schoolchildren. The entourage processed past thousands of admirers who lined the streets until they reached the Catholic or the Maronite Cathedral, where his body was blessed by the Archbishop. Once thought of as a rebel by the church, he's welcomed home as a celebrated native son. One of the speakers, a Christian speaker, said he was a Sufi sage for all humanity. And then that procession by foot made the 50-mile journey from Beirut to his home village up in the mountains of Bishari, and all the way lined with townspeople. They stopped 20 times for local ceremonies. And then he was eventually laid to rest as he had requested in the hermitage grotto of his childhood, high up in the mountains, raw, surrounded by the beloved, his beloved cedar trees. And that's now actually part of the Gibran Museum. More than ever, Khalil's own words rang true. For in one soul are contained the hopes and feelings of all mankind. The uh, life journey and depth and breadth, I think, can't help but challenge us all. His words continue, I think, to reverberate in hearts and minds and souls, stirring the reader, the hearer, whoever he or she may be, to journey really toward a deeper dimension in life. He reminds us that it's time to reach across the divides that surround us and break down walls of inequality and justice. It's time to build bridges to, in whatever ways we can conceive and seek peaceful resolutions. It's time to defend the vulnerable and oppressed it's time to unite and see our own reflections in the faces of all others. It's time to find a way to carve out room for quiet and respect for creation, the environment. And it's time to delve deeper into our own faith traditions, whatever they are, past all the outward imperfections and trappings, really to the core of life. And in one final vignette from Khalil, his words inspire and challenge us toward our greater selves, that phrase he used a lot. The little vignette is titled, Set a Sheet of Snow White Paper. Set a sheet of snow white paper, pure was I created, and pure will I remain forever. I would rather be burnt and turned to white ashes than suffer darkness and to touch me or the unclean to come near me. And the ink bottle heard what the paper was saying, and it laughed in its dark heart, but it never dared to approach her. And the multicolored pencils heard her also, and they too never came near her. And the snow white sheet of paper did remain pure and chaste forever. Pure and chaste and empty. I close with the moving words of Khalil's good friend, Mikhail Naimi, who wrote the first biography on him just three years after his death. 
For some purpose unknown to you and me, Khalil was born in Lebanon at the time he was born. And for a reason hidden from you and me, Arabic was his mother tongue. It would seem that the all-seeing eye perceived our spiritual drought and sent us this rain-bearing cloud to drizzle some relief to our parching souls. Now, I can talk for another two or three hours, but I think I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was shockingly deep and surprising. Uh, as before we were on air, um, we I was saying um, I hadn't realized <clears throat> um, what an influential figure he was. Uh, there was so much I didn't know, even though I, I, I've loved his work for, for so many years. And, um, uh, and now my mind is even blown more than, than before after hearing you speak. Um, so there are a couple of, uh, or there's a few questions. Um, uh, well, here's one from, from Lisa. Lisa, she writes, uh, wonderful sage and way to honor and amplify him at this time when he's much needed. <clears throat> Thank you. I wondered if you felt him helping you in this noble, generous effort. Yeah, no question. And I think that's a great question because the book's really a personal book in a lot of ways. And uh, so in writing this book, it was my own journey. And he was kind of a guide for me on my own journey. Um, and there were many things I could resonate with myself, having grown up in a more uh, what I would consider uh, exclusive, intolerant uh, Christian community. And, and yet I was a minority. I grew up in a Muslim culture and all my best friends were Muslim and so the two didn't connect. And so Khalil served in many ways as really a, a guide for me, uh, a seer, if you will, uh, as I was trying to, you know, uh, take my own journey, you know, way back. I just, uh, I was introduced to him when I was in high school at a boarding school in Côte d'Ivoire in Ivory Coast, but uh, through the book, The Prophet. But I knew, like most people, many, many people, of course, know about The Prophet but they don't know much about him. And so it was when I began to study his own life, I thought, oh my, not only does it, you know, is it something that I think is very apropos for my own journey spiritually, but this is a message that I think the broader world needs to hear beyond that book that he wrote. And so that's the background to writing this book. So thank you. Great question. Um, <clears throat> there's a question from Ed. Uh, he was wondering um, what, if you could say more about what his personality was like, um, how people would have described him as a person when they were interacting with him, maybe more about his relationship with Mary Haskell. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, first of all, we would not, hardly anything would exist. And uh, I'm not even sure all his creations would be there other than the painting part, but his writings, if Mary Haskell uh, had not come alongside and really been, um, I mean, you could say his muse, but she also was much more practically, uh, you know, a patron, support and encouragement and definitely an editor. You remember he's writing in his second language here. Uh, that beautiful prose poetry is written by someone who's writing in his second language, which is remarkable. As a person, he was much more gregarious uh, and adventuresome and what you might say extrovert and social during the first kind of three fourths of his life. And during the latter part, he became much more of a contemplative, much more um, almost cloistered in many ways during the latter part of his life in, in his studio. People would come to visit him. Often they would come, so many would come that he hardly could get any work done. Um, and, uh, but there, as his reputation, you know, expanded. But, um, I would, you know, so I would have loved, of course, to have the privilege myself of kind of encountering him to kind of see firsthand. But that's just kind of the the reflections that others have actually expressed about him uh, when they wrote about him after his passing. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Leo asks, um, what changes, if any, are in the 2023 edition from the 2017 edition, if you know? Um, which he says was noted as a spirituality and practices best spiritual books of 2017 winner. Uh, I, I mean, in, as far as the prophet is concerned, it's republishing and it's kind of never gone out of print. 
from 1923 to now 2023. So it would be the exact same text. Uh, and so as long as you only see the prophet and Khalil Gibran on the cover, that's what it would be. There are many that have ta taken and kind of played off of it and uh, almost assumed, um, in a sense, their own kind of sen uh, revelation in the spirit of Gibran or the prophet. But uh, I don't pay actually much attention to those. I, I look at what he writes. So the prophet shouldn't be changed at all, would be the same. So, and even the format, uh, if you look at it, is often the same because format was very important to him. So he actually, in many ways, I want to show you. So, for example, all of the all the artwork in the prophet is his and each is thought very specifically related to that page. So he was very involved in the actual um, with Knopf, uh, the publisher, uh, in uh, its creation as an actual work of art as well. As I look at uh, the picture that you just showed, um, it, it kind of ties in to uh, a question from Nilo, um, because I was thinking he, his work and his writing reminds me quite a bit of Blake, William Blake, in the drawings, too. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she was asking, who were his artistic and literary influences? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, without a doubt, Blake was. And Rodin is the one, Auguste Rodin, who first mentioned Blake to him. And, uh, and Gibran, as a result, went immediately to a bookstore to get a copy of, of some of Blake's poetry and discovered the, the visual art component to Blake as well. And, uh, but then he was also influenced at, during con at contemporaries during his time, uh, such as Tagore, for example, uh, and some other Arab writers and mystics, uh, including some of the, the Sufi mystics of the past. Um, and he was very, what's fascinating to, and in the book, I, I talk about this, you, uh, the library that he had, his own library is in uh, Bishari in Lebanon. And you can see all the books that he actually collected and what he wrote in and how he marked them. And so he was very influenced by Tolstoy, for example, some of the Russian great writers, uh, Dostoevsky. Um, and so that's the genre, kind of you get a sense of where he gravitated to you know, in that way. But I think in many ways, he uh, was kind of, I think Blake would probably be the single person that kind of um, captured his imagination for his own uh, expressions of creativity, both the visual and the poetic. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess um, we're getting close to time, but I just had one question. You mentioned uh there was a museum it sounded like in mexico of his artwork mm -hmm. and then also there's a place in lebanon with his 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 library where where would you say would be the best places to uh, pil make a pilgrimage to, or to see his legacy well the the closest place of course to see a lot of his uh visual art and some of the what you might call paraphernalia you know that was in his uh that belonged to him everything from hats to walking sticks and da da da, -da. Uh, and then a number of letters uh, would be in Mexico City at the Museo Sumaya, which is interesting, the largest collection of his work in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's also the largest collection of Rodin's work in the mm -hmm. Western Hemisphere, interestingly, also. Uh, so it's interesting how those two have ended up together. Uh, and then, of course, they're the mother of it all, really, is to go to the Gibran Museum in the village of Bishari, in Lebanon, and uh, it's not difficult to get to. It's a gorgeous scenic drive. My first visit there was in the middle of the deep winter, and so I write about that in there, you know. And it's snow, you know, several feet of snow, because you can ski there, and it's like you know, uh, Southern California. You can ski and uh, surf on if you wanted to, or scuba dive on the same day. And um, but it's a very special, mystical place. Uh, it was a hermitage, I think Carmelite at one time, and um, but now it's all completely the museum and the grotto is actually where he's buried. Um, but I found I've been there numerous times and um, it does not disappoint. And you, you get you really it embodies many ways the kind of the spirituality of Gibran. And it's fascinating to see the pilgrims that make the trip there from every imaginable, you know, walk of life and church uh, uh, background and, and interreligious background. So he really is a figure 
But again, most going know very little about him, you know, and um, but they have a lot of his art there. And the artwork that they have is primarily kind of his ethereal paintings that are in more in the line of like Blake in many ways. So full of mysticism. Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> this has been a kind of a pilgrimage, I feel, this uh, talk and, and conversation. Um, thank you so much for uh, showing us about uh, Khalil and, um, and also for all the, we didn't really talk about it, but all the interfaith work that you do and, uh, you know, carrying on that legacy in, in your own thank life. You. And um, so I just wanted to remind everybody, um, the book In Search of a Prophet is available from Banyan Books. Uh, and here is the book cover, In Search of a Prophet, A Spiritual Journey with Khalil Gibran. Um, so um, thank you, uh, Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler. Thank you. Thanks for My coming. My privilege. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining tonight. Take care. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.